All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. So I'm um, really grateful to be here. Um, I think it's largely because of the Mind and Life Institute that I'm able to pursue a career doing scientific research on compassion and meditation. So I'm, I'm really happy to um, share the work that I've done and how Mind and Life has supported my um, endeavors. So what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about how I got started, how I got interested in this work, some of the work that I did, um, which was supported by Mind and Life Institute, and then tell you about where I want to go next with this work. So my entry into this field began uh, when I was an undergraduate in a psychology class several years ago, and I had a particularly unique experience that had a profound impact on me. It was the first day of the class in the first day of the semester, and the professor, Dr. Kent Hoffman, did something that I'll never forget. He asked every student in the class to write on a three by five note card the little voice in our head that we hear throughout the day that we wish that we didn't have to listen to. So this was um, odd, and it, it piqued my curiosity. And I sat in the room, and I looked at everybody around me, and they, were, they seemed so put together. Everyone was very attractive, very attractive people. So I was wondering what's going to happen next. And it was an intimidating experience for me. So we wrote down on our cards, and uh, the professor collected them, and then he read them aloud anonymously to the whole classroom. And just thinking about it now, um, it's heartbreaking. It almost brings me to tears just thinking about what happened next. The voices said things like, you are not worthy to be loved. You'll never be good enough. You'll never amount to ever anything. It's only going to get worse. And instantly in that moment, my mind shifted from seeing myself and the other students as separate. And immediately I realized that we shared a common but invisible thread of self-criticism, doubt, shame, fear, and worry. And this led... Um, an impact, it had, had a profound impact on my awareness of the human condition. And we all share universal experiences of suffering and difficult emotions. And we all have universal cravings to be loved, to be in relationship with others, and to have social connections. And so this raised a question for me, what, where is this coming from? Why are we all heartbroken, so to speak, and what can we do about this? Part of the answer in the class came from a set of ideas in psychology called attachment theory. And attachment theory looks at how our early experiences as infants with caregivers shape the foundation for all future relationships and human interactions. And the basic insight of attachment theory is this. As babies and as child, we have an instinctive urge to form bonds with our caregivers. And this especially manifests in times of stress and difficult emotion. Babies seek out that comfort and, and reassurance from their caregiver. And when things go well, when the caregiver is responsive and attends to the needs of the baby, the caregiver is communicating non-verbally. I am here for you. You are worthy of my attention. We all have difficult emotions, but we can navigate these experiences together. And as this is repeated over time, a child develops trust that there's caregivers there to be supportive and provide some secure base for the child to navigate the world. But unfortunately, caregiving doesn't always unfold in this way. And even the most empathic parents, the most empathic person, can sometimes have lapses. We all have stressful experiences. And occasionally, we may not be immediately responsive to the needs of our offspring. And so as a result, we all have some element of insecurity in our relationships. And these insecurities reinforce that invisible voice, that invisible thread of self-criticism and doubt that myself and my students all wrote down on our 3 by 5 note card. And so again, this raises the question of, what can we do? What can we do to improve social connection and improve bonds throughout our life? And in the class, and also um, incidentally, I learned about the power of compassion. And I was particularly impacted by the writings of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And I learned that in Buddhism, there's a sense that we all suffer and we all want to be happy. 
and that compassion is the basis for human survival. It's through our own suffering and our own difficult experiences that we can empathize and connect with the experiences of other people. And here I saw a lot of parallels between attachment theory and Buddhism, and thus a point of intersection between science and religion, or science and spirituality, and that is that we are all interconnected, and that compassion is the basis for human survival. And this was the seed for my desire to try to understand compassion and what we can do to increase compassion in the world through scientific studies. So then fast forward a few years later, and I was fortunate to learn about the Mind and Life Institute. And I attended the Summer Research Institute, which uh, Susan described. And this is really a transformative experience. Um, at this event, we get to, as young scholars, we get to meet and interact with some of the most prominent and productive people, the leaders of contemplative science and contemplative practitioners. And it's in a very communal setting. It's in a, in a former monastery. It's not just scientific and scholarly debate, but we actually get to meditate together, eat meals together, and it really builds a family of people who share values and interests. And I learned about research looking at the effects of meditation on the brain and the rigorous designs and questions and procedures that are needed to really understand the impact of meditation. And I reinforced my desire to study the impact of meditation on pro-social behavior and pro-social relationships. And so it was through a Varela grant and the funding of the Mind and Life Institute that I was able to pursue those questions. And so uh, what I want to do next is so show you a study that I conducted as part of my dissertation to look at the effects of mindfulness and compassion training on real-world pro-social behavior. So the study was set up like this. There were um, people from the Boston community recruited into a study on meditation and cognitive ability. So they all thought that we were going to look at how meditation affected their mind, whether, whether it made them quicker at processing different types of information. And they would come together and do eight weeks of meditation training with an expert teacher. And the teachings were provided by Lama Willa Miller, who um, is ordained in the Tibetan tradition and has many uh, years of experience of teaching. And I also happen to be connected to her through colleagues I met in the mind and life community. So half of our participants did eight weeks of meditation training and then half um, just carried on in their life as usual. They didn't receive any training. And afterward, after the eight weeks, they came back to the lab and they thought that they were gonna be doing tests of cognitive ability. But that wasn't the true observation that I was interested in. What I really wanted to look at was whether or not the meditation changed their levels of pro-social behavior in a real interaction with another person. So to do this, I had to create kind of a stage play. And I hired some of my undergraduate research assistants to help me put together a little orchestrated scenario. So here's what it looked like. Um, this is the hallway where our lab is, and there is a waiting area for people to wait for their sessions to start. And this is a communal area, so it's out in the public. And there's this nice bench with three seats. And two of the people in those seats are actually actresses. They were placed there. Um, they're sitting on their phones. They're just minding their own business. They're not interacting with anybody. And then the one true participant, in this case, it's the student with the teal sweater, she showed up and took the last remaining seat and sat there and waited for her experiment to start. Then, a minute or two later, a third actress came from around the corner using a pair of crutches and a walking boot. She hobbled toward the waiting area. She sighed in discomfort and pain, leaned against the wall. <laughs> she pulled out her phone to check the time as if she was waiting for her own lab session to start, and then she just settled in. Uh, one of the confederates sitting started a timer, and we checked to see whether or not the true participant would give up her seat for the person on crutches. And this was our, this was our measurement that we were looking at. And um, this might seem like a really simple gesture, but in fact, this is a very well-known paradigm in social psychology that's been observed in many different contexts called the bystander effect. So when there's other people present who do not act to help, our own levels of helping behavior decrease dramatically. We depend on other people to 
cue us as to what the appropriate behavior is in some circumstances. So in this case, it would discourage people from actually giving up their seat. And that is what we see. So generally, we find that most people in this scenario do not give up their seat. And here's some results. So among the people in the non-meditation condition, three out of 19 people gave up their seat. Only 15%. I was shocked by how low this value was. But encouragingly, of those who received meditation training, 50% gave up their seat, so 10 out of 20. So that's three times the amount of people that engaged in this pro-social action. And I was particularly excited by this finding. My colleagues and I were really happy, and it suggests that meditation increases our willingness to spontaneously come to the aid of a suffering individual, even when there are social pressures that are acting against that motivation to behave pro-socially. So since this work, we've done a number of studies to try to further explore um, extensions of this work. We've looked at whether or not training delivered through a smartphone app, whether people can train mindfulness on their own without the use of a social group and a, a live teacher just using instruction on an app. Does it produce a similar effect? And indeed, it does. Just two weeks of mindfulness training through an app can show the same of a result. <coughs> suggesting that through a, an app-based meditation, we can lower the barrier of entry to meditation. So for people who don't have the same maybe time and resources to access an expert teacher, they can still access some of the similar benefits. I've started to look at whether meditation can be used to um, act as a buffer against the experience of anger and promote resilience to interpersonal conflict, and we're starting to see some evidence that it does, in fact, work that way. Now, in my ongoing work, um, I'll just mention briefly, I'm starting to look at the experiences of mindfulness and compassion in romantic partners, in a real relationship in everyday life. So not just looking at compassion in acute context, in a one-off situation with strangers in a laboratory, but what does compassion look like in everyday life, in a real relationship? And how, does, how do couples interact with each other, and how are they connected, and how does this um, improve with mindfulness? And finally, as um, Susan mentioned, together with a number of colleagues in the mind and life community, we want to bring together people from a variety of different perspectives, from Buddhist studies, Christian studies, different fields of science, to really look at what are the big questions in the science of compassion, and what work do we have left to do? And here is where we're at. First, what is compassion? Is it merely a simple emotional state? Or is it a motivational stance in which we experience ourselves embedded in an array of social relationships connected to others? How can we train people to experience and, act, and enact compassion? What are the varieties of different techniques to increase compassion? And what can we do to make these training programs more accessible to people from a variety of different populations? And then finally, how can we assess compassion training? So I showed you this one uh, method to try to get at pro-social behavior, but what can we do to understand the varieties of types of compassionate actions and compassionate intentions and what it's like to be in, in the presence of somebody who is truly acting out of compassion? And again, I'd like to just thank the Mind and Life Institute. They're really a major player in promoting this work and um, a major inspiration for me personally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Really, Thank you. really great. Love to um, just open it up to the panel to ask Paul any questions or share any reflections you may have. Oh, I, have a, I have a question. Why do you think there is this connection between med meditation and compassion? I mean, a priori, one does not necessarily need to posit this being such a connection. So mechanistically, what do you think is going on? Um, there's two things, two possibilities. So I think with compassion training, it involves explicitly focusing on similarities of emotional experiences. So um, the story I told about the beginning and um, sort of being exposed to the inner voices of the other people in my class and how that sort of 
shapes a sense of commonality in our emotional experiences and interdependence. The compassion training techniques um, explicitly use that kind of reasoning. So using our own difficult emotions as a doorway to connect with the difficult emotions of other people. And in a sense, this makes our own negative experiences and emotions less personal. There's less ownership over it, and it's an understanding that it's, this is kind of the human condition, and that creates some space for empathy and compassion. Um, the second possibility through mindfulness-based practices of focusing attention on a particular object and creating a kind of equanimity around our emotional experiences, so not trying to pursue positive experiences or avoid negative experiences, again, creates more room for awareness of difficult emotions and more space and energy for empathic processes. So I think there's these two distinct pathways that the different kinds of meditation promote. And this is something we need to continue to explore as a field. Great. Thank you. Anybody else have a quick question or comment? Maybe, um, I mean, one of the, uh, Susan brought up this point about the fact that, you know, compassion is not an easy task to do. You know, compassion almost necessarily involves taking on some element of distress of the other person. So, and often uh, in difficult relationships, we, you know, I mean, human beings are naturally averse to negative experiences. So probably a lot of people resist compassion because they don't want to go to them in that. So, I mean, what would be, I mean, is there a, a possibly, probably the question I'm asking is, is there a route to compassion that wouldn't involve going through this difficult route of empathy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or is that an open question that... It's an American thought. It's an American thought? <laughs> 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 I, I wonder if um, the practice of mindfulness um, allows you to uh, loosen the attachment to your identification of self in mm -hmm. a way yeah. that might allow for an openness to the needs of others. And whether or not that has to be painful, I, I don't know. I think it's an empirical question, but maybe it does sometimes and maybe not other times depending on how much practice you have or... I'm just thinking that I know, that I think that experience you described is this understanding that, mm -hmm. that this is a human condition and it's not just me as an individual. Uh, yeah, and I think my hypothesis is, is that mindfulness practices and compassion practices both promote that sort of awareness and ability to hold negative emotions in awareness in a way that isn't distressing. Mm -hmm. um, so potentially, creating some space where there's not necessarily an empathic distress around other people's negative emotions, but a, just a different way of being aware and relating to it. But again, that's, that's gonna be, a, I think, a lifetime of research to really dive into the details of that question. I do think, Thank though, you. that there's something there about emotion regulation that is playing some key role that mm -hmm. underlines a lot of what we're seeing some in there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So we are going to take a very, very brief stretch break. And I mean very brief, so stand up. And, just, and then we will um, watch the um, Faces of Compassion um, video. So.